I'm Dr. Kristen Rager. I uh, really appreciate y'all letting me be here today. My, I am a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist in Nashville. I've been taking care of children and teenagers for more than 20 years. I stand firmly with my transgender patients and their families against HB 578. I believe that this bill is unnecessary and also dangerous and has been proposed based on misperceptions of medical facts. And I'm here today to offer some clarification. Number one, no one in Tennessee is performing sex reassignment surgery on the genitals of transgender patients under 18. No one. Number two, prepubertal children in Tennessee are not being treated with hormones or hormone blockers. Let me repeat that. Transgender kids who have not entered puberty yet are not receiving hormones or hormone blockers. Number three, Young people who have become, begun puberty may be treated with puberty blockers, which are safe, effective, and fully reversible. Hormone blockers push the pause button on puberty once it has started, which gives everyone involved a lot of time to do their research, to meet with experts, and gather their support systems. If stopped, puberty continues on normally. Puberty blockers, again, are safe, they are reversible, and they are life-saving. The American College of Pediatricians that was referred to earlier is an anti-LGBT hate group with a couple of hundred members nationally. Yeah. The American Academy of Pediatrics, so this is the AAP, not the ACP. The American Academy of Pediatrics is the well-respected professional organization joined by the vast majority of pediatricians across the country with a membership of more than 70,000 pediatricians. The AAP and the Tennessee chapter of the AAP strongly oppose anti-trans bills such as this one. Federal courts and statutes have consistently recognized the rights of parents to make informed medical decisions regarding their children. Doctors here in Tennessee follow well-established stringent guidelines for taking care of transgender youth. There is zero, zero evidence to suggest there are dangers within our current system of care in Tennessee. So where does the actual danger lie in the care of young trans folks? We have all heard the heartbreaking statistics about the mental health risk in trans youth, including depression, anxiety, and suicide risk. More than half of them report feeling suicidal and one out of three report a suicide attempt. However, it is important to note that these dangers occur in teens who are unable to access medically necessary treatment. Trans youth who receive appropriate care, such as we are currently providing across Tennessee, their risks go down to that of their non-trans peers. HB 578 will effectively block transgender youth in Tennessee from receiving life-saving health care by requiring three physicians to sign off on treatment. With a limited number of specialists in Tennessee, this will create- I apologize. I'm, I'm gonna have to stop you there. It was the okay. end of the three minutes, but again, we'll have unlimited time yeah. for question and answer if Great. anybody has any. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know that's what that meant. No, no, well, we, that was an accidental alarm, so sorry about that. Yeah. Um, any questions for our uh, Representative Beck, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you were saying about uh, life-saving. Um, yes, sir. Uh, how, did, how does this affect these young people, and, and, and how, is, how are uh, the, beta, the, the puberty blockers life-saving? How are they life-saving? So the question is, how are puberty- Dr. Rager, you're, you're recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how, is, how are puberty blockers life-saving? In my experience in taking care of transgender youth, and there are also studies to support this, that transgender youth are at risk, very high risk of suicide, frankly. If they're not allowed to have appropriate medical care, appropriate medical care would be med medicines such as puberty blockers. And when we use those, it saves their lives. It prevents suicide. I, I have unfortunately, seen patients die from suicide before. I hope that is something that you guys never have to experience, um, but, but never in a child who has received adequate, adequate medical treatment. Representative yes, Beck, you recognize for follow-up? And so your testimony is under this bill, they wouldn't receive the adequate medical treatment because it requires three physicians to sign off. Is that what you were saying? Yes, sir. Dr. Rager, you recognize? 
Yes, sir. I, that is what I'm saying, that the barrier of requiring three physicians to sign off, three specialist physicians, frankly, um, and specifically just how an adolescent psychiatrist it is a huge barrier that patients will not be able to overcome, and it will directly result in patients not being able to access care. Representative Beck. What would a bill like this show to uh, trans, trans young people about what we as a society are saying about them? Oh, my word. Dr. Reger, if you, if you, you don't have to answer the question if you don't. I don't know if it specifically. Well, no, what, what I think was asked is what, what, if, what would a bill like this, if passed, show transgender youth around our country that we think about them? Correct. Um, sir, I think it says that we think their lives are not valuable, that we do not care if we pass a bill that will directly result in their deaths, and even more so than death, sorrow and misery in Tennessee families. I was born here. I chose to come back here and raise my family because I love this state, and it makes me sick to think that children and families in our state believe that we care nothing about their lives, and frankly, that we hate them. That's what this feels like. Next I will, can I finish? I'm sorry. Can I go on? I have patients who are coming to my office right now crying, families who are crying because they're afraid their child will die if this bill is passed. Can I go on? Certainly. I, I have to say that this is how I think about it. Um, imagine that you have a child with a medical condition that's completely treatable, but it's rare. And so you look and you find a specialist who you know can take great care of your kid. You find them, and that's me. You bring your child to me, and you're like, please help us. We're struggling. My child is suffering. And, and, I, and they say, do you know how to help us? And I say, yes, I, I absolutely know how to help you. But I can't because our state legislature has decided to pass a law saying that I will go to jail if I do. And that, and that you, mom and dad, because we involve both parents in every decision, can also go to jail for this. So I'm sorry we can't provide your child with life-saving care. That, that's what I feel like you're asking me to do. And, and that's why I'm here right now. Because, because it, it's keeping me up at night thinking about that. I took an oath that I would not do harm. And that would be providing, that would be presenting direct harm to children. This bill will not protect children. Let me be very clear. This bill protects no child and in fact puts children at risk. Risk of harm, risk of depression, risk of anxiety, risk of death. Thank you, ma'am. Next on my list, I have uh, Chairman Holsey, you recognize? Thank you, thank you, Doc, for being here. I can't remember the exact number. Four or five years ago, the chief of psychiatry at John Hopkins came out with an article and said there was a percentage of kids and adults both who after a period of time wanted to come back to whatever the biological sex that they were born with. Have you found a percentage like that in dealing with the children that you deal with? That's a really... Oh. Dr. Rager, you recognize? That's a really great question. I think that parents often want the answer to that question. And in my experience, that number is tiny. And most importantly, those kids are not damaged in any way. They're not regretful in any way. They've just had a different plan. Um, I, I do not think in any way that the idea that some folks um, may decide to change medications in the future is a reason to pursue this bill. This bill remains dangerous as it is. Allowing people to access adequate medical care is not dangerous. Chairman Holsey, you recognize? Yes, thank you. Okay. Next on the list, I have uh, Vice Chairman Sexton. Sir, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Rager. It's Rager, it? Rager, not to be confused Rager. with Reagan. <laughs> okay. Um, you had mentioned something about a LGBT hate group. Yes, sir. Would you care to repeat that? I didn't catch the first part of that. Yes, Dr. Thank Rager, you. you recognize? I think this is a very important distinction. The American College of, of Pediatricians, which was referenced earlier, the ACP is an anti-LGBT LGBT hate group with a few hundred members. It's a relatively new organization. Um, the organization where the majority of pediatricians join, more than uh, approximately 70,000 pediatricians, is the AAP, 
the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly opposes bills such as this one, and specifically came out with a statement um, uh, earlier this week um, saying that they oppose these bills across the country, including the one in Tennessee. The AAP is the organization that is well respected across the country that pediatricians join. And again, they strongly oppose both the national organization and the Tennessee organization strongly oppose this bill. Pediatricians care about kids. Pediatricians and whole, their, our whole job is to protect kids. 70,000 of us across the country oppose bills like this. Vice Chair Sexton, you recognize for follow-up. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So I am going to assume, so I'll answer my own question, <laughs> that this group, by their own definition, does not call theirself a hate group. I'm going to assume that you are pinning that on them, that you are calling them a hate group. Now you've you've said that this is a hate group. You have used the term we hate them. You you have used the term this is life saving, as if these children are going to die if they don't get this procedure. You have used the term, it protects children. You have used the term, dangerous. All of these things, in my opinion, are your opinion. And just because that you claim there are 70,000 pediatricians, that you speak for all of them, I would prefer that we'd have all 70,000 with their signatures so that we don't claim that you're speaking for all of them. So I want you to understand, I don't hate children, I love children. And I don't hate people that are different. And it offends me when someone else tells me that I hate because I have a different opinion. I love this bill because I think it protects children. I think it saves lives, and I think it gives the psyche something to wait until they're adult. We don't have children uh, that are going and buying alcohol until they're 18. But we're saying that they can make a life-changing decision when they're still a child, when they don't, when they're not allowed to go buy alcohol until they're 18. So yes, parents have the opportunity to raise their children. And I think parents ought to have the right and not some doctor that calls me and the people that are different in our opinions that we hate. I do not hate. I would just like for you to know that. Thank you. Thank May you, I Vice Chairman Sexton. Um, May I speak? Dr. Rigger, if you'd like to respond, just so, just so we're clear, we've got several folks on the list to testify today and several mm -hmm. folks who'd like to ask you questions. Great. So you can take as much time as you like, but we are limited. That we only have the room until 530 today, okay. just to give you a heads up. First things first, uh, I am not deeming the American College of Pediatricians to be a hate group. The Southern Poverty Law Center has deemed them a hate group. Um, so that's just not my opinion. The difference between an organization and me? Anyway, um, I... Um, Ma'am, I'll tell you what I we're going to do. If you could hold on for me. We're going to go ahead and move on. I've got several folks on the list. Okay. And again, my job here is to help maintain order in this committee, yeah. which is why I call on you and then I call on a member. So if you could just just give me some eye contact before you, you get started I'm and I'll, I'll call on you. Uh, it's just my job to be the referee yes, here. Sir. So if you could help me out with that, I'd appreciate yes. it. Next on my list, I have Representative... Uh, Farmer. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, I have Representative Lamberth. Just a couple of questions and yeah. one. Thank you for coming here today. I'm trying to kind of get to the bottom. This is a lot of opinions and strong emotions on this issue, obviously. Um, would you at least agree to me with me that when you were meeting with a parent and a child or parents and a child, that this is a very serious decision that they may be embarking upon. Dr. Rager, you recognize? I always meet with parents, both parents, if there are two parents and the child, and absolutely we treat this as a serious issue. Okay. Leader Lamberth, you recognize? Thank you, Chairman. And that decision can change their life on how they make the decision, both positive or negatively, like many medical decisions can. Is that a fair enough statement? Dr. Rager, you recognize? Will you say that again, please? 
Leader Lambert. The decisions they make in your office can both positively or negatively affect their lives um, going forward. It's a very serious decision that they're making, and depending upon which pathway they choose after you meet with them, can have serious repercussions on their lives, either positive or negative, depending upon what, that, what they choose. Is that an accurate statement? Dr. Rager? I believe what you're, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused by the question. I believe that what you're saying is that choices in the office are made by parents and their children in conjunction with a knowledgeable physician such as myself. Um, and that is the norm for medical decision making about health care with children under 18. That is correct. And all choices that are made in health care may have unique outcomes. Leader Lambert, you recognize? I'll ask it a different way. Yeah, sorry. So when I go to the doctor as an adult, I meet with my doctor, I have a physical, the doctor makes recommendations on eating better, more exercise, kind of standard things that they would say could potentially improve your health outcomes. I have a decision to make. I can follow that doctor's advice or I can make my own decision. Depending upon how I choose can positively or negatively affect my life going forward. These children that come to you with their parents, depending upon what they and their parents choose, again, would you say can have either a positive or a negative uh, effect on their life after they meet with you? It's a relatively straightforward question. Dr. Rager, are you recognized? I'm sorry that it's confusing me. Okay. It is. Fair enough. Leader Lambert? So when they meet with you, these children, and again, I, I'm, hold up, before I do this, I don't want to make an assumption. Have you had an opportunity to actually read the language of the bill? Absolutely. I have a Dr. copy Rager, of the Dr. Rager, are you recognized? I'm so sorry. Leader Lambert. Thank you. And doctor, if you'll notice, I go through the chairman as well. So it's, it's not you, it's us. It's, it is the, the way in which it prevents folks from just kind of talking back and forth over each other. So chairman, thank you for maintaining order. We all appreciate it very much so. Um, doctor, in this bill, again, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, these children and their parents come and meet with you and uh, whether you understood the question I was trying to ask or whether I just wasn't asking it um, the proper way, I think when a child is going through a difficult situation like this and they are questioning their own gender, um, I would consider that very serious. And depending upon what they and their parents choose, um, I would imagine could have some very positive or negative effects on their life going forward. In fact, it can alter the entire course of their life depending on what they choose. When they're sitting in your office, is it their choice or do you guide them one way or the other? Because I've had an opportunity to look at your website, but I have drawn conclusions from that, but I would like to hear it from you. Do you help guide these children toward a, a decision that you feel is in their best interest? Dr. Rigger, you recognize? My job is to present information, to present medical facts, um, not opinions, but actually medical facts that I've learned through my 10 extra years of training and 20 years of experience. My job is to give them information, and then the child and family make the decision that is best for them. Leader Lamberth, you recognize for follow-up? How often do you tell them that they are merely questioning their gender identity and that they should maintain their current course in puberty and their birth gender identity? Dr. Rager, you recognize? It's a very specific decision based on the child, I think that you are assuming that I am guiding everyone down a path of changing their gender, and that is a false assumption. And not everyone comes to me wanting to do that. Many people come to me just to talk and to learn because they're curious, and, and they're just there to talk to an expert. Leader Lambert. Doctor, I find it very interesting the questions that you're avoiding today and the ones you're jumping right into. So that's fine. This is how you make your living, correct? On guiding children on how to choose a gender that is not necessarily their birth gender. That's, that's how you make your money, right? Dr. Rigger, you're recognized. I am a pediatrician and adolescent specialist who sees children and adolescents for many different things. This is not the only type of medical condition that I see in my practice. Leader Lambert. So, yes, this is a portion of how you make your living. 
taking care of children. Thank you for your pause. And what I, I want to, and I think this line of questioning is important. I want to be very careful that we stick to the substance of the bill and, mm -hmm. and, and we don't, Dr. Reger certainly not on trial here this, uh, no. this afternoon. Um, I think this is, this is helpful and I think it's relevant, but I just want to make sure that we stick to the substance of the bill. So Dr. Reger, you're recognized to respond. If you, if you like, you may not, no. you may not wish to respond. I'm a pediatric and adolescent medicine specialist. I see patients for many different diagnoses in my office, not just for gender concerns. And I don't get paid differently based on the choices that they make at all. Leader Lambert, you recognize? Chairman, I'll wrap it up. I just, you know, doctor, I was trying to give you an opportunity to maybe explain a little better than what the website does. It's probably displayed on your website. Um, you know, it seems like you seek out patients that are in this arena, and that's fine. I mean, that's that's your business model, it appears, out, at least from the website. Mm -hmm. And if you've read the bill, the bill requires, you know, a couple of doctors to sign off on this, both parents to be involved, um, somewhat some of what you have described. And if you have a problem with them getting a second opinion, and if you have a problem with them making a decision that might not necessarily match up with your opinion, I've made medical decisions in my life that my doctor disagreed with. I could feel their disappointment. These children are very impressionable. Uh, Ma'am, you can make a face if you want to. You'll have a chance to respond in a moment. But you're a doctor. These children do look up to you. All I would ask of you, and you've, you've come here and you've spoken some very strong words to us today, and I'm not going to be as strong back, but I would ask you to please tread very carefully, and I would hope that you do, because many times a child may be coming to you looking for help, and I'm trying to make sure that you don't shove them down a path that might not necessarily be where they want to go. And all this bill does is ask that they at least have multiple doctors advise them, and not just one, who again, just from the website, and that's why I was asking the questions, appears at least that this is a pretty good chunk of your practice. And I'm sure a financial decision doesn't have any effect whatsoever on the way you treat your patients. I would hope that it would not. But at the same time, this bill makes sure everybody's on the same page before they go down a course that is a very serious decision. So that's the only point I was trying to make is that nobody's barring you from being able to guide children, especially once they hit puberty. But it does make sure that there is more going on than just your opinion or guidance on the issue. But I appreciate your testimony today. Um, obviously, you sell this pretty strong to us. I do hope you have a much softer touch in your office with these young, impressionable children. Dr. Rigger, if you wish to respond, you can, or we can move on to the next questioner. I would love to respond because this really isn't about me. It's not about me at all. It's about the kids. And I am not unilaterally making any decisions for any children. Again, we involve families in every decision, often other providers. And I find it offensive <laughs> that the way you're characterizing this for me right now. Next on my list, um, and members, again, I will, um, of course, I want to give everybody enough time to ask questions. I have several on the list. We have three more people to testify on this bill, and we have several other bills on the calendar today. So when I call on you, if you feel like you need to ask your question, I'd love for you to do so. If you feel like you'd like to pass, you can do that as well. Um, next on my list, I have Representative Griffey. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll try to be brief. Thank you, Dr. Reagan, for being here today. Let me see if I can ask it this way. If this legislation passes, is it fair to say that it w may have a negative financial impact on a part of your practice, your current practice, medical practice? Is that a fair statement? And again, Representative Griffey, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, um, but we, we've had questions directed to the witness about her medical practice and I, I think I think that strays from from the bill. You, you recognize her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I would just simply comment that whether uh, somebody that's presenting testimony to the committee, if they have a financial stake in the outcome of legis legislation, I think it's fair for this committee to at least be have the opportunity to question the witness about that and let the witness answer that. So, if if I may, I, I would like that question answered. If the chair would allow it, please. Dr. Reagan, if uh, sorry, uh, Rager, if you. <laughs> If you wish to answer, you, you may. So I see patients for anxiety, depression, eating disorders, acne, P 
period problems. The list is very long. This will not negatively financially impact my practice. There's a lot of teenagers out there who have concerns right now, especially during the pandemic. So I, my, my protest against this bill is purely for the impact that it will have against children and adolescents and their families and not my business. Representative Griffey, you recognize for follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask you this, please, Dr. Rager. I you indicated you found it offensive uh, the way a question was characterized or something. I, let me share this with you. I, I do find it offensive that uh, you feel this bill is discriminatory, that we don't care about uh, Tennessee children who are going through these issues. Uh, my heart breaks for everyone that has to deal with this issue. And l let me go on to this. It's is it true that gender dysphoria, there's no blood test, there's no DNA test or chart you can look at and, and point to and say, this person's going to have tra uh, gender dysphoria or is transgender or this one's not. It's, it's all self-reported, is it not? Kind of like pain. Dr. Rager, you recognize? It is a clinical diagnosis, as are many others. So there, you're right, there's not a blood test or a... CT scan or something. Representative Griffey. Is it fair to say it's all based on self-reporting by the patient? Dr. Rigger? It is not. Representative Griffey. <clears throat> Let me ask you this, Dr. Rigger. Have you ever advised a patient against proceeding with uh, puberty blocker, transgender uh, approach? Dr. Rigger? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Next on my list, I have Representative Hardaway. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, ma'am, for being here. Uh, thank you for the profession that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. I've known quite a few pediatricians in my life, uh, OBGYNs, and I know that uh, it wouldn't matter what we pay, Charlie. It wouldn't be enough. I've got three children. Mm -hmm. They've uh, seen the uh, pediatrician any number of times, and of course their mom, uh, an OBGYN, there is no amount of money uh, that, number one, would be too much for me to get the kind of care that y'all uh, provide uh, for the mothers and for the children. And the other is I've, uh, I've known OBGYNs uh, who do charity work. Uh, they, their own lives are earned. Uh, because they've got to be available to their patients. And I sense the same type of dedication from you, and I appreciate it. Um, the organizations that you cited, uh, one with a couple of hundred members and one with 70,000 members, I'm proud to say that my pediatricians, when my children were small, were members of the American uh, Academy of Pediatricians. And uh, every pediatrician that I've known uh, has been professional, has been dedicated. And I think, uh, like them, you are probably dedicated to doing no harm. Okay? Uh, I think the last question that was asked by my colleague is whether you have advised both ways, okay? whether you give the best advice for the individual for the best outcome for that child. Is that accurate? Dr. Rager, you recognize if you wish to respond? The, the way that you described that was perfect. Yes, that is accurate. All right. Thank you, ma'am. And your Representative opinion, Hardaway, do you wish to be recognized for follow-up? I do, sir. You're recognized. The, um, your opinion, when you offer an opinion, to your patients. Is it a personal opinion or is it a professional opinion based upon, as you cited, 20 years of actual practice, which includes the 10 years of extra training, 10 years of extra training. Which opinion are you offering to your patients? Dr. Rager, you're recognized. That's not going to stop me. <laughs> His words were so excellent, it turned the lights it off. It turned the lights off. Um, You're recognized, Dr. Reagan. 
Yes, thank you. I'm nervous and I'm speaking less eloquently than I would like to. The way that you said that is perfect. Yes, it is a professional opinion, not a personal opinion. Right. Pers a, a professional opinion based on many, many years of training and experience. Representative Hardaway, do you wish to be recognized for follow Yes, sir. And when we're um, talking about the, the actual content of the bill uh, and the portion that calls upon the patient to have to uh, have the, uh, the three opinions, uh, how difficult is that? Uh, it's my understanding that your particular profession is short of professionals already, that we don't have enough uh, pediatricians. And I would uh, uh, dare say that we have even fewer who have your specialty. Is that accurate? And, and whatever other comments you want to make on Dr. Rager, you're recognized. Yes, sir. I think that is really an excellent point. You know, I, I don't know of any other medical procedure that exists that requires three physicians sign off on it, first of all. Um, it, it, it is a huge barrier, um, both because seeing three physicians is a lot, um, but in particular when they are specialists, um, of whom there are few, very few in the state and very few across the country. Um, we're talking about adolescent medicine specialists, um, like myself, and pediatric endocrino uh, endocrinologists, and child and adolescent psychiatrists. Those are probably three of the most thinly staffed uh, specialties around the country, and, and especially in our state. It would be impossible for some children and families, for many children and families, to access those three. And, this, and th therein lies the barrier. Thank you for clarifying. Representative Hardaway, you wish to be recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm uh, coming to an end. Um, the, there were a couple of uh, points that, uh, and you were quite uh, uh, strong in, in your comments, that the bill uh, would, uh, well, let's go to the, the pre-puberty uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, dictates in the bill. Uh, you're telling us that we don't have to worry about that anyway, because that's not what you do. And you're also telling us that uh, when you do use the treatments or the therapies, that it's designed to help the patient. It's designed for the best possible health outcome for the patient. And that could be physical health, it could be emotional or psychological health. Uh, is that true? And expound. Dr. Rager, you recognize? Yes, sir, that is true. The only recommended treatment that we have for people who are prepubertal is for parents to just love their children, which they're very happy to do. Uh, the recommended treatments that we have for those who have entered into puberty are treatments that are recognized by multiple national guidelines as being the standard of care for these kids. Um, they are safe. Uh, specifically referring to hormone blockers, it's completely reversible. Um, in, in my experience, there's, there's, I think that the issue that kids need to be protected from this care is is probably the sticking point for me is is the this care is actually protecting them